Um, well, you're here. That's us. Uh, you're looking for the bathroom. The men's is like behind the elevators, which is always confusing to me. Um, yeah, I'm Michael Parker Smith. Um, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I'm really great at this, as everyone should know. Um, some Linux news. So they have a working model of that whole MIT laptop thing, which is kind of cool. You actually spend hundred dollars on a laptop to develop the kind of world for the screen that works and full sunlight and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Um, did you hear? Did you hear the statement where he, where, where the I forget the guy's name, the, but the guy behind that project explained why you need volume to make the project work? Did you hear see that? No. Oh, he said he went to a uh, uh, he went to a laptop. Or he went to a, uh, an LCD screen maker, and or he met with you know one of their executives, and he said, you know, now he said, he, you know, he said, you know, because of our price goals, you know, we can live with a couple of dead pixels. We can live with this and that and the other thing. And the guy said, well, I'm sorry, but you know, our strategic vision is we're going to be making everything with you know no dead pixels and this and that and the other thing. And, the guy said, hmm, that's too bad because I need a hundred million of them. And the guy said, we might be able to change our strategic <laughs> <laughs> That's why you need to build a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's too bad I need a hundred million of them. Wow. <laughs> Ten bucks a piece? I don't know what they're paying, but it's not, yeah, but I mean, it's not a small order. Also, the, uh, I, mean, I can't pronounce their name, um, no. but the guys that used to be IBM's desktop. And it's not Lenovo? What is Lenovo, it? yeah, that's it. I, just, I wasn't going to massacre it um, on my own. Uh, Sick, J. Leno, well. <laughs> um, they, just after our last meeting, they said, oh, well, we're not going to support Linux on anything that we build. Um, and apparently, they today or recently went back on that and said, "Well, we were just kidding. We, <laughs> if, if you pay for a license, we'll pre-install it for you. We don't have a problem with that." Um, which apparently was they don't want to deal with the licensing of Linux for some reason. Um, who knows why they would make that decision, other than that whole. Chinese decision that every piece of equipment that gets sold in China has to be uh, has to be support Linux might have something to do with the Chinese company deciding that well maybe we're going to support Linux. Yeah, I, mean, I was wondering that. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody drew that line, but I was thinking theoretically they can't sell in their own country. <laughs> well, I mean, because I mean. It, yeah, well, it's, okay. it's pretty new in the last couple Yeah, apparently weeks. China has now said that you can't sell a computer in China that doesn't have Linux support for it. It's this whole, you know, we don't want to be, de we don't want to be dependent on a large American company. Thing. How would I have not heard that I'm a Linux professional? Because you because you spend too much time doing real work and not enough time trolling <laughs> the yeah, you don't read Slashdot like incessantly. You don't have an addiction like yeah, it, yeah, how, yeah, you don't spend enough hours a day reading Slashdot. <laughs> <laughs> or just reloading the page going, Come on, he's got a new story. New story. New story. New story. Remember what did I say you email that said you need to get some you need to get somebody who has the ear of, of, of the top brass whose job is to spend two hours a day so reading the movers and saying your work. So. Um, Troll Tech, all the KDE fans, um, the guys behind uh, QT, it's apparently going public. One of those Scandinavian countries, I think, is where they're located. So, it's not exactly probably the same as going public here. Who knows? They're allowed to say stuff. Because so. um, it was short term before they were going to be going public too, compared to what it is here. Um, and Andy Tannenbaum and Linux Thorwalls had, had, uh, yeah. had a nice little back and forth discussion over the whole yeah. <laughs> versus okay. micro kernel. Yeah. And you know, I always love the engineering argument, which is, yeah, no one's really gotten those micro kernels to work very well, have they? Um, oh, somebody let them in, it would be great. Remember that, because I'm going to refer back to that one yeah. in my talk. Um, so 
I knew what the main presentation was, so I didn't have to talk to some of you for the uh, short presentation, and no one volunteered, but I think. I did. I think so Tom, Tom did. did. Yeah, Tom did. He was gonna he was gonna boast about Suse Ten One. I think. Yeah, I just so that pretty much what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you did more than one set of discs. Does that, does that mean it took you it took you a, the, all the time since the release to get it installed, or well, part of that time <laughs> was waiting for it to download through uh, BitTorrent, uh, 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 and then re-upload, and then finally burn the discs, um, and then finally deciding to actually take the or take the plunge and, and wipe out the hard drive and start over and all that, which meant I had to back this up and all those fun things. Um, which, of course, you do religiously daily anyway. Yeah, right. That was the Windows partition. <laughs> Actually, the other part of it was that Windows itself had finally completely died on the system. I was getting the green screen of death, where it comes up to just the first background and the light comes ever show up. Anyways, uh, other brief item. I had this one that I got from the Pomona Computer Show. Um, they were giving away iPods as a, as a come on to at least sign up with them. Linux workshop, the only thing I realized after I got this home was that they have the wrong name for teaching Linux, and that is Gates College. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe that's why they didn't use the price. I don't know. Uh, but that's not really local here in Pomona. Um, they stress that they will not be learning how to use a GUI. You'll be learning how to use the command line. But I have this in case anyone wants to sit there in the computer shopper magazine. They're fairly local. Anyway, so as I was installing um, SUS, I took a moment to actually write down some of the neat things I saw on the installation list of things that weren't defaults. And I came up with this one called ImageSeek. And something about the um, description of it caught my attention. It said, you know, well, how do you search for images? Like, say you wanted to find a spoon, a picture of a spoon. How do you tell a computer to search for a picture of a spoon? Well, it turns out they have a very simple way. Spoons are kind of gray, they're kind of round, they have a handle, and you say, search for spoons. <laughs> and there you got spoons! <laughs> Plus, I didn't get trouble being choked. <laughs> okay, well, I happen to have a whole lot of other pictures on there, but it was kind of amazing that, yes, indeed, it would actually find things sort of close to what you drew. Wow. That was like, that's pretty impressive. If you drew yeah. it like sideways, you do it vertically? Yeah, at least that. Well, let's see. We have that around, some sort of thing like that. We find the vertical spoons they have pictures of. <laughs> ah, so this, that's the limitation. You have to know the direct, the orientation of the object you're searching for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then you can click on it, and we'll find more instances of similar objects. Uh, are those other objects similar to a spoon? Or a spoon to eat cheese cake? Oh, my sister collects spoons and things like that. Well, the other semi-nice things. Um, you could do a picture of a fashion model. Huh? You could do a picture of a fashion model. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's a really tiny window and a really big pan. Um, but they also let you do things like import other media. Now, it turns out that one of the other things, I guess, this is mostly probably KDE. They have their My Computer folder, which looks like somebody else's My Computer folder nowadays. Which automatically pops up the fact that, hey, there's this new volume out there. And it's got pictures in it. And let's see if I have a good picture of this one. That one? No, not that one. That was just a little blurry. He moved. Uh huh. Sure. It's the dog's fault, not the operator. Okay. There's my dog. 
And at that size, it's almost scary. <laughs> <laughs> that changes everything. So if I come down here and I say, um, I want to import, and that happens to be on. Yeah. Uh, I see. Search for other. You keep somebody to me. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> really kind of mess up your system. No, <laughs> this is cash. It's, 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 it's pre-programmed for for computer users. No matter what you type in, it always hits the cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think. Mean, you're, you're, you're letting me remember what the picture, what most of the pictures are of. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I happen to find a really nice site. I use that for my for my wallpapers. Okay. Uh huh. Well, it's got this one that says find a random selection. That works pretty good. So. <laughs> I'll never look at silverware the same way. <laughs> Okay. Um, let's see. Um, do you happen to know if this is a mono application? Uh, since it's part of KDE, it's probably a QT. I knew there was a lot of new mono things. In yeah. Um, Uh, it turns out that I think it does um, mostly the average color and um, probably some primary shapes or um, I, I would say maybe a Fourier transform on, on the image to see where the, the boundaries are to so look for a similar image. I don't know, the guy had, the, it turns you out... You'd want to do a way with transform. Yeah. It turns out that one of the other things it will do it lets you group things. So I can't have these things. He was selling me you know, hardware at kind of a fire sale. That's where I got my dual CPU system for. What company is this you speak of called VA Linux? There is no such thing. <laughs> I still got some of their stock. <laughs> well, they're not called VA Linux. Um, anyway, so then some of the other things it does, I think it says, yeah, create HTML. Does it do a slideshow? Yeah. Of the entire collection, which is going to be kind of random because I've got all sorts of things. Unfortunately, as it could be edited, and spoons. spoons, yes. Sorry, that was the last picture. Go back to it. I wonder what that transform is. Is that a fast transform? So, I just figured out how to do it. You add things to the batch and you say, uh, yeah, we want um, want the dimensions of the thing, and the file size, because I haven't actually done anything else. Uh, and it looks like it'll pick up all sorts of exit tags from the image itself if they happen to be in there. And 
quite a bit of them. And I guess so that. Nice. We're going to do that and say finish. And hey, it says it did something. Yeah, generate an album. I say uh, home directory. I should have some new album. Oh, which actually had another one. Is this your old slow computer? This is my old slow one gigahertz computer, yeah. Uh, so it generates a web page. And when you click Whoa. on things, it shows the whole thing. Whoa. I mean, it makes a thumbnail and the link. Yeah. And it will, it, it'll make it so you can export it out to your uh, web provider and all that. Clean, clean, clean. So that was some of the neat stuff that I happened to pick up in this, in this last batch. Um, any thoughts, comments, or questions? You want to see some more of the cheesecake? Spoon. Just a nice <laughs> pair of spoons. <laughs> Is there anything in this uh, that Novell would have uh, put in that, that Seuss was? Well, that's. Had some connectors. And yeah. Um, Novell basically bought Seuss and is now running the show behind our funding, I guess. Right. It. So you'd assume that maybe they were slipping something in. Well, there's Zen. Yeah. And, and all that. Uh, which I haven't checked into yet, um, but apparently it's a lot easier. The answer is probably if, if Novell wrote it, then it probably came from the guys that used to be with. Uh, I think name that company that Novell also bought. Zimian. Zimian, yeah, and that's why he asked about Mono because they're the Mono guys too. Right. Um, so. Well, I know that there, I know that there are a couple of things now in in Ten One that. Pretty much, if you use a desktop there, where well, you're actually depending on mono, which doesn't have to. I mean, no one's needed mono for anything before. I think they're desktops. I think Beagle's in mono. So, you know, since every since everybody but me seems to have trouble finding their files, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> That's what really deep directory trees are. Oh, oh, no, there's an, see if there's an XSI on there. No, that's more. Okay. But there's the pin file pulled right up over there. Go wait for that one to. This is probably the first time I fired up Open Office on the system, so we probably do fun things too. Yeah. Um, oops. Oh. The thing about this is it's now being done by a group calling themselves OpenSUSE. So at the last release, um, it was available for download the day it was actually released in the stores. This time, it was actually available for download before it appeared on the store shelf. But it's, and then I think after it was available for download about five days later, it was available from Novell online. Well, uh, OpenSUSE is, is Novell's attempt at uh, right. It's, it's, it's like it's another Red group that's actually providing it or doing no, it. it it's, if, you, if you understand the Fedora Red Hat relationship, okay. OpenSUSE is the exact same relationship. Okay. So this is solid pushing. Yes, it's the same as the Oh, and by the way, if anyone that got here after I said it, there's no access point here, so that's open. It's not Caltex, so if you're trying to get your network to work, and well, it's my fault. You can stop. You know, Mike, we'd fire you, but then we'd have to find a replacement. <laughs> so you're totally safe. Congratulations, <laughs> Dustin. You've been elected. No, what's up? See what I'm it never doing. works. I keep trying to do that. People are like, nominated, we should do I this. And I say, you should do that. You're not in charge of that. If nominated, I shall not run. If elected, I shall not serve. And who? And Paulson. Yeah. Okay. Close enough. Uh, let's see. I don't know what you do with this, as you said. Mm -hmm. 
little oversized. Just, just hit F9. Or F5. They changed it. Running a window. faster for you? consumer market and OEM installations, and Michael Robertson's original goal was to sort of pick up the whole Windows 98 market that was not willing to buy for XP. Um, so, so there was always this goal that we never had an clickety clap. So it's not a typical Linux distribution. We try and make everything come up and work and just automatically go there. We don't focus on making, you know, putting up, oh, you just do run the patch things. We do everything all together. Um, uh, our big, Product is Pokemon, which is a one-click uh, thing. I'm not. I would show you a little more of it, but I'm not on my machine here. Um, uh, but 
uh, it basically, it's, it's a web application. We distribute the, uh, we take all of the Debian repository of software plus ones we've contracted for, we make nice web pages for them and put them up. Uh, Linspire users can go open up the click and run client, they see a, a, an application they like, they click on the green running man, it installs it on their system. So it's a, a wrapper around the app, but that's a very small way of saying there's a big delivery system there, which makes it very easy. When we first got it going, David's kids, Michael Robertson's kids, uh, they were all playing games on Linux because they could browse web pages and go and play five years old, six years old. They can go and do this. So it's pretty cool. <clears throat> so the question is, how do you go about making something like that happen? Uh, this is uh, the original goal here. Really, is to try and is focused on click and run to try and make a uh, a software marketplace where many producers of software can communicate with many users of software, much the way that mp3.com worked for music, where independent artists could communicate with people who uh, liked independent art, which there are not all that many, as it turns out. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the, we have a community translation and Irma tool, which is uh, we put the packages up on the website, and people can go and translate them, and then we turn out OS with them. David is in charge of the hardware detection. Um, and if you haven't tried the Inspire, you may want to try FreeSpire when it comes out and try our hardware detection because I think it's second to none, really. So FreeSpire is going back to it's as we were talking about with the open SUSE thing, it's it's to go back to sort of a more traditional Linux model um, to get the, the CMR thing works. We, we know that it's pretty well developed. FreeSpire is to sort of try and tackle a medium level distribution where developers can use it. All the man pages are installed or not. Man pages and compilers are not installed by default on Linspire because our assumption is that people don't even know what they are, just the way they do on a Windows machine. So this is more like a traditional thing. However, we maintain what is our strength, which is a simple desktop. And one of the things we focus on tremendously is file type supports. Um, we make sure there are mind types for every kind of document out on the web. Out, document out on the web. If you go to linspire.com slash file types, you'll see a huge list of document types, media formats, all that kind of stuff. Windows codecs, Flash media players, all those, before we ship an OS, all those work out of the box on the little click out of your browser. Um, two, if you play Flash media things, they will stay in sync, the audio and the video, which you'll probably not find on any other Linux distribution. But we worked very hard on that. I haven't tried them, tried them recently, but that's something where things fall down. That's something you really need if you're going to the supermarket, is that if you know you play the llama song and the llamas are over here and the, you know, you're getting the, the lines, but if you don't know the llama song, go look at it. It's a great way to tell if your video is staying in sync or not. So, FreeSpire, um, we're tackling the, the the more difficult crowd, really, um, which is developers, because they want everything and they know everything, right? So they, they want things to be the way they have experienced it in Linux for a very long time. We take a few liberties and type a few things up in Linspire. Free Fire is supposed to do that. Um, and we're going to make CNR more developer friendly so that you can get source code directly using CNR. You can make some patches. No, oh, I didn't like the way they do this. Just ship it back to us and hopefully we'll grab it and toss it in and make it available. So we're trying to harness the developer community more. Um, and we've always kept our app pools closed because management thought that was a good idea. And <clears throat> we've, they finally seen the light on that. Okay, so the process of building a Linux distribution is like laws and sausages. You really don't want to see how it's done, um, how they're made. Um, and you, you, I mean, if you think about it, we're a derivative work, right? So we start with a huge database of code. We tweak it. We distribute it for lots of people to use for many different reasons on lots of hardware. And then we go around again, except you've got to do, do it all again. And that's not your typical set of programming skills, right? Most people, they, they work with a code base, they create a program, and they maintain that one program. We problem hop like mad, because what you gotta do is go in and fix OpenOffice, because it doesn't do this one thing. So you gotta pull in the million lines of code of OpenOffice, fix five things in it, and send it, try and send it back to these guys, and send it all to these guys. So we find that we have pretty high level people working on things, on problems that require a great deal of flexibility. So, uh, uh, 
it. For example, David is always debugging machines that he doesn't actually have. Um, so it's a question of gathering information from our remote machines, diagnosing what's wrong with their X server or something like that, and modifying the detector so that when it goes back out, it will actually work correctly on the machines. That's a non-trivial thing to do. So um, packaging, even just the simple act of putting pack software into Debian packaging I mean, is a non-trivial thing. Anybody who's read the Debian policy manual will understand there was that. Um, Release management is not a solved problem in any distribution. Um, and there are certainly the tools for it are kind of flaky. Hardware detection is getting a lot better, but it's still kind of weak. Um, we have a small team. Um, so in order to tackle these big problems with a small team, where the community is not tending to solve these problems, we feel we need to use the best single tool possible. And that's functional programming for us. So the biggest reason is static type checking, okay? When you compile a program in, say, Python, it's possible that you're left with a situation where one object will send a message to another object, and that other object won't be ready to receive that message. It won't have that method defined it. Static type checking leverages the mind share of the theory community to help you as much as possible before you send the thing out in the field. So the goal is to reduce runtime errors. That's one of the biggest reasons we do. I mean, and, and, and leveraging the, the, the theoreticians is the best thing. There's a term that they use all the time called referential transparency. Roughly speaking, that means you're not allowed to have side effects in your code. Okay? You're not allowed to write a function that does some I.O. on the side unless you say that function is going to do some I.O. on the side and you construct it in there properly. Okay? So it's a little bit, it's a little bit sort of, you know, it's like putting on a, a spacesuit. You're a little constricted, and if you gotta go to the bathroom, you gotta you gotta be prepared for that, right? So uh, there's it's it, it takes a little work. But the big goal here is that getting rid of side effects lets the theoreticians run optimizations that they couldn't otherwise do. So for you in the compiler, and you have the, the potential for parallelism at the backside. And as we've all seen with dual core processors coming around, it looks like quad core processors are right around the corner. Exploiting parallelism is going to become more and more important. Um, we deal with a myriad of little, little languages and two-level languages. Python is a two-level language. Um, you have a nice interpreted environment. But as soon as you need to do something serious, you drop down into C++ and write some stuff there, and then you go back. And so you have this sort of dual layer kind of thing that you talk about in there. Tickle TK did the same thing with C. There are lots of examples of that. Now you have little languages, op, set, these things which lop off a particular problem like text processing, and they try and optimize for that. Then you've got to learn the, um, you know, the regular expressions for off, the regular expressions for said, and regular expressions for Perl, which are all different. Um, and Perl is actually really quite, does the best, but then it's kind of got its own crazy little space going on. Um, and it's just, in terms of data structures, you know, hash tables are fabulous, but going beyond that takes a little quite a bit of work in Perl. So um, anybody who's really interested in this, John Hughes wrote an excellent paper, which is easily findable on the web, called Why Functional Programming Matters. So Haskell, in particular, David has been programming in, in a camel, an objective camel, for, for quite a few years. He's got a very fast compiler. We just forced him to switch to Haskell within the last few months. And it was, nobody likes being knocked off of their favorite tool, right? But on the way up today, he's like, well, you know, they're just something about Haskell that's just a little bit better, the libraries are better, the language features are better, and it makes things much more, just that much tighter and that much more efficient. Um, it's got a long history, but my, the most interesting thing to me is the Glasgow Haskell compiler was originally started at Glasgow University. Um, the researchers who are now maintained it are paid by Microsoft and they work for Microsoft Research. Um, there, are, there were a total of 80 proposals from students for um, Haskell Summer of Code. 
uh, projects this year, nine were accepted, and they're all on sort of core interest in Haskell projects. So um, you can go to the IRC channel for Haskell, and there's almost a, there's over 100 people on there almost constantly. So the community is growing; it's looking more interesting. Uh, okay, this slide doesn't have. I saved it in a format which I was sure that this open office would understand. Um, I started with top 10, and I did a strikeout on it. And I went to 15, and I went to 20, and I stopped counting. So. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful features in Haskell, so here's the whirlwind tour, okay? Um, first of all, it's beautiful. It has this look and feel of being typeset. And this comes from, in part, um, well, it was a very conscious design of the, uh, conscious effort on the part of the designers to make it look like mathematics. Stems from mathematics. They want they want to do as much as mathematical as possible. So it looks like mathematical, uh, like a good mathematics textbook. Textbook, and they, part of this was they left out all of the curly braces and semicolons that you find in C. And so if you indent a little bit, I think I have an example. Nope, I do someplace else. Um, if you indent, um, oh boy. That, uh, I know what's going to happen. That next slide didn't say, well, we're going to have to redo the thingy. Um, uh, so, but if you indent your code, uh, that's that's fine. The code is not here. Um, it's on there. Yeah, no, there's, there's a figure there that's missing. Because okay. I didn't because I didn't do the right one. Is this on now, too? Uh, it should be working out now. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I well, your key, that is. Yeah. Your key is not, you're not running off of your key, right? Right. Um, I moved it to our. Right, so, presumably I can pull that key and. Sorry, folks. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, that the open office format does not understand um, everything goes in one file. Well it just doesn't understand certain certain things. So it just it says uh, it just goes ahead and tosses them away. Uh, so let's switch to this one. Normally, I would just uh, fake it, but all of the figures for the next 15 slides are uh, in there. Okay, so let me try and explain the point about the indentation while Tom's helping me out here. Um, that white space matters. So if you indent, that's like creating a block structure. So it's like in introducing a curly brace in C. So you can get rid of all of the curly braces, you just indent your code correctly, and that, that creates the block structure for you. So it reduces the noise a whole lot. You want this one? Yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah, there you go. This is actually supposed to be at the end of the line, but you see this code that there's no curly braces, everything's just indented, and that gives it this sort of nice typeset feel. You can use the curly braces and the semicolons if you want, if you're generating code or something like that, you can put them in there. But as a result, the code gets a nice look to it. 
Yes, but yeah, that's essentially yeah. it's essentially the same as Python, except in Python you don't get a choice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so lists are uh, a big part of functional programming. The lists are built in, although they are not really, I mean, they're defined using the mechanisms of the language, so you could get rid of them if you wanted to. So they're very, they're very carefully constructed. Um, you can take an element and compose it onto the front of a list, which is represented by square brackets and that, and you get back one, two, three. Um, strings are lists, so if you take a list of characters and give it to the interpreter, it'll say, oh, look, this is a string, and give it back to you. So um, there's this nice, it, it treats, it shows strings as strings all the time, but in fact, it treats them as lists of characters, um, which means that all the tools you work on lists, that are, this is a nice big library for working with lists, it's sort of the default data structure. You can use all those to do all your work on strings if you like. So, um, oh yeah. Um, so I talked a little bit about the static typing before. The goal is to reduce the runtime errors. Um, the other nice thing though is that the types are inferred. The type system is carefully chosen so that there's always sort of a minimal answer to when it, the compiler can look at an expression and it can figure out whether it's a valid expression or not, and if it is valid, it can figure out what the types are. Um, you, so you can put signatures on your function, please. You can say this, this function has a particular type, but you don't need to. People do it as a way to document their functions and make sure that they're getting what they expect. Um, so, Here's the interpreter again. I, I'm asking it what the type of this function is, hello, which takes a single object and says, is it in this list of objects? And returns you a Boolean value. And we'll just ignore this part right here for now. Um, and it says, well, it's got this funny type out here, okay? It says A and a list of A and a Boolean with the arrows in between them. But when I ask it to, what's the type of Ellen applied to the number two, it says, oh, well, your type has changed now. This thing is, you know, notice that this part here has changed. It's going from something that's called EQ of A to something that's called num of A. Um, and this first A has disappeared because I provided it already. Okay, so I'm going to explain a little bit of the magic of what's going on there. But the important thing to notice is there is that it figured out that something went from type being EQ to uh, this num going on, and it got rid of one of these parameters on this type function here. This is a very <coughs> nice feature. It lets you sort of write code in a big hurry, and you come along and put type back on it later. So what are those type variables, those, those A's in there? Those are type variables. Um, and here's a definition of a tree, and this is a type variable. So here's a, I'm defining a new type called tree, and it can be a tree of anything, a tree of A's, right? So um, a, tree of a, a tree, a binary tree, consists of a node with two trees of the same type in it. And, or it can be a leaf with something of that type in it. So that's, I mean, what you would get from, you could easily define this in C as well, but the abstract, the, the algebraic data type description is quite nice and quite pleasant to work with. I'm not going to go over pattern matching in this talk, but walking over a tree like this is very easy with pattern matching and with the polymorphic types that are there. Um, lists are a parametric type, and they've got a special notation for them, but they can be lists of anything. So here's an example of where you get wonderful benefit from functional programming. Here's a function called map. And it, if, you, if you take a list of anything, and in this case, A's. Well, let's call them integers for now. I've got a function, say, that takes integers and it converts them into their corresponding string to print them out. Map will take that function, the print function, or in this case, the show function. It, I've got a list of integers, and it'll give me back a list of strings. So let's see some examples of that. Um, in this case, reverse is a function that takes a list and reverses it back to front. So I now have a list of, oops, lists, because strings are lists. So I'm going to take reverse and apply it to each of these strings in here and get back a new list. Okay, so I'm going to take reverse 
And I'm going to say reverse of hello, reverse of there, reverse of world. Get back in the list. But it does reverse the whole list? Nope. Because he, ma he mapped it over the list. Right. So I, I picked a little tricky example there. <laughs> just to serve sort of subconsciously. Let's look at the next example. If you took the, the map away, then it would just reverse the list. Yeah, it does. Don't go there. <laughs> um, um, successor is a function that given an integer returns its successor. successor. So it adds one. So in this instance, I think what's going on is more clear. I have a list that's one, two, three. I'm going to add one to each element of the list. I'm going to apply the function to each element of the list. Okay, so I get back a list that's really successor of two, successor of three, six, or sorry, successor of one, which is two, successor of three, etc. Um, yeah. Learning Haskell in, in this format is really not possible. So. Um, this is one of the things that's a little, the downside of functional programming is the learning, learning curve is a little big. It helps to have somebody sitting there working with you for quite some time. As a colleague of mine at work said, it doesn't really leverage the mind share that I've been building up for quite a few years. The C++ and all this other stuff he's been working on, things are very different here. And that's true. Um, but it's worth it if you take the time. So here's another function, fold. Okay, a fold is you've got a list of things and you've got an operator. Let's take the operator times. I'm going to stick, every place I've got a comma, I'm going to put the operator times. And I get an expression, one times two times three in this instance. I take that expression, I evaluate it, and I get back six. And in fact, this one right here is, it actually, it'll take one times two times three times one. So you can actually you can give it sort of what's the zero of your uh, algebraically spirit speaking, the zero of your monoid or your group, um, and put it in there. Now, but you can think of that basically as just, you know, you've got a big long list of things. You want to smush them down into one value by putting an operator in between each of them. That's what a fold does. And the reason, Notice that, so the reason the reason for that first argument is essentially to make it behave reasonably on lists with you know zero or one items or something. One yes. Is otherwise, otherwise it doesn't actually mean anything. That's right. Um, there's also there are also trickier uses of the fold that are way more advanced that that you can start doing stuff with that value. With. But um, but that is sufficient for now. Notice in all of this. The definition of fold doesn't know anything about integers. It simply is given a function, the operator times, and a number, and these guys, and it just goes off and, and applies that function. So you can write things that operate on structures that don't know very much about the types inside of them by using functions to sort of separate you from the, from the data, and handle the data. And that, in practice means you get to reuse your code. And you get to reuse a whole lot of functions, reuse a whole lot of functions that these guys have written for you. And the list operations in the list in the default library are very, very complete. And I, every time I start writing to something custom program to look at the list, I look at, oh, well, it's really if I just take it like this and I do it like this, and I fold it and I zip it together and I'm all done. So, um, Here's, a, here's another couple of examples. Um, oh, well, I told the interpreter to bring in, here's the module system. Work. I told it to go out and get me the data.character module. So these are the functions which are used for handling characters. And I said, let's map the to upper, which takes a lowercase of any string and puts it into uppercase, across the, the list of characters represented by the string hello. Of course, it returns you this, OK? So we, we're seeing that this is. It's the tricky, a little tricky getting used to the fact that strings are lists, but this is exactly equivalent to seeing things in square brackets. So here is zip, which takes two lists. And I went ahead and did the tricky thing of using a, a list which has got the square brackets and the commas, and a list which is just looks like a string. And it sticks them together into these little pairs. So it goes down each list one by one, it takes the first element and sticks from each and sticks it into a pair and the second and the third together. Question. <coughs> yeah. If those lists did not have the same number of elements, would it I would just it drop off, off it would just drop off the stuff from the longer one. Really? Yeah. 
I mean, that's, that's not so. That's, so it has that's a that's a that's a feature of zip that it goes down and it says, well, if I've got an empty list, then I stop. Okay. It could be written to throw an error at that point. You all right. do whatever you like. But that would be a runtime error because it looks like the length of the list is not a part of this type. Yes. That's correct. Um, not completely true, but the default list, yes. Uh, and, and I'll get back to asking that question at the end of the talk about the about the lengths of the lists. Okay. Um, zip width. In the zip width case, uh, oh my second argument got down here. So so that's the arguments to the function. I say zip width. Here's the function plus, and I have two lists, one of which is ten times the other. And zip does the same. Zip width does the same thing as zip. It takes element piece by piece but it applies a function to unify them into one value, and you end up with a, a list of things, okay? So, my goal here again is not to, to do a tutorial on Haskell, it's to give you a, a sense of, if I can use these functions in here, and the types all just man magically get sorted out, but it doesn't, let me, it doesn't let me do anything bad, it won't let me add an integer in a string. It'll never let me do that. As long as my types are correct, then I can start doing all this powerful magic with these guys, and it doesn't take a whole lot of space. I don't have to write big for loops with curly braces and things. I can start putting these things in nice, tiny little spaces. And you start learning these things, and you're like, oh, well, yeah, uh, just zip and map these things together. It's like Legos. You start putting stuff together, and off you go. Can I go back one? Oh, no. Here's another example of fold. Okay, so again, here, a fold. We take an operator, and we put it where the commas are. In this case, I use plus where the zero is zero, and I get back the answer six. I can do the same thing on strings. In this case, I chose in my zero the empty string, but I have three strings here in a list, and I stick them all together. Concat oh, I'm sorry, this is the string concat This is the list concatenation operator. You take two lists and concatenate them together. Strings are lists, so you concatenate them together. So, you start developing techniques, and you learn these techniques, and this language has sort of, it's almost annealed to the point where these things are just so convenient. And some of this stuff is made possible by type classes. This was, here's one of the cool things about Haskell. Haskell was started in 1987 by a group of researchers. Um, I see it on my screen. It's not a screen line, it's a video problem. Oh, you know what? Maybe the projectors have been running. It's a problem that doesn't want to run anymore. Over here. Also, check the simple things, like make sure the plug is still. Like, yeah, but is the light on, Tom? No. There's just one red light on. Huh? Then I went to sleep. I didn't disturb yeah. the cord, did I? No. Okay. Next worst thing. Everybody <laughs> stay <laughs> close. Hey, Tom, I think we should blame it all on Susan. <laughs> all right, now here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll try and do this without... Green line. Green line. Green line. There you go. Ah. Yeah, it overheated. Did we have it do that before? Yeah, I think it did once. Mm. When, did we, when did we move to this room? Was it after the summer? No, because I recall that we figured out that during the summer, the buildings are actually locked and the doors in the classrooms right. are locked. Right. So we, so we have figured, figured that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a type class. Um, classes in C++ have methods, functions, which, which are defined to operate upon the data that you define in a class, right? <laughs> Java has signatures, which it uses to do multiple inheritance off on the side, right? Um, and a signature doesn't let you do anything with data. It doesn't let you do inheritance. It just lets you define kind of a function. That's the closest thing I know to type classes. Um, they were introduced halfway through the history of Haskell, and they really, really improved it. 
Um, unfortunately, they're a tough subject, but I'm going to try and um, get it. Um, for every object in the language, the show class is defined. So you can take anything in the language except the function. Well, you can, you can even do it for a function, but for all data. Um, uh, the show operation will convert that data to be a readable string. <coughs> so if you, if you just say show on the number one, it'll give you back a string that's the number one in the string. Okay? So the class show says, I, anybody who's an instance of the class show needs to provide this operation show where we take any, you know, whatever you guys are, if you're, if you're an integer, then, then we need uh, a function that's an integer to a string. Okay, so, um, and, and the, in the case of integers, the thing that, that you know, it's like printf, the, or sprintf more technically, right? So that it takes an integer and gives you back a string. Um, so you can create an instance of show, so for my type, and you can put in strings of my type that indicate that, and then you can append, you know, whatever the, the language wants to do for the show of the data you've got inside there. So you can recursively do that. Um, so, in other words, every time, if I created my type, or create an instance of my type, or do a show on it, I'm going to get something that says my type, and then say the number one. If I had to do a show. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually hard to write an instance of show, as he's pointing out that this is it's sort of a recursive definition. Um, but this is, the, this is actually the definition that the language will derive for you. You can actually create a class, uh, a data type, and say, oh, just derive me show, and it'll make one up that's more or less like this. Um, and so the busy work of, you know, ah, I've got to make a print out of this, rep, of, out of this data structure. I've got to write some code to print some stuff out. You can just say, derive me show, and it'll give you a reasonable representation of that. That almost looks, that, that recursive definition almost looks like a uh, call to super. Yeah, and, more or less. Um, it's, but it's, like it's, there's no, there's, <coughs> the, 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 you want to get out of your mind that C++ took the data. Well, the C++ doesn't have call to super. I'm thinking about more like Objective-C or something. Well, all right. Have access to, to the previous method that I'm about to override. Right, well, it, it's, I don't like that. Okay. I don't like that representation. It's more of a recursive thing. I want to show a tree of integers. Here's how I show a tree. Integers know how to be shown. I will recursively call the show for integers. Okay? And that representation is much nicer. C++ is, is left me rather starved, I think. But, um, and one of the reasons the type classes are so lovely is they separate the data from the methods. You don't have to you don't have to define your block of data and then the methods on it at the same time. You just define what the methods you want to be. And later on you say, well, hey, this thing is, should be an instance of that class. And I'll show you some examples here in a minute. Um, and then you can define what the, what that glue should be that puts the two together. Okay? Now, how do you use type classes? Um, I, you saw earlier that I changed the type on something with the enumerators. This funny syntax right here takes a while to learn how to read. But what this says is, if I've given an A, and it's an instance of the type class ordinal, then I'm allowed, then I can make this function list of A, give me a list of A, and I'll return you a list of A. If, but if you give me something that's not a member of the ordinal class, this thing is not going to work on it. Okay? So, what does that do for you? Well, it's, this hierarchy is probably a little tough to see, but the big letters are all that's really important here, right? So this is EQ. If something, almost all things are members of the EQ class. That is, you can do a quality testing on them. Things that are not members of the EQ class are functions. You cannot take two functions and compare them to see if they're the same function. Yeah, you might want to think you could, but but theoretically you can, right? Okay, so yes. so you, you can't in a nicely implementable way on a computer. <laughs> no, you cannot. You cannot guarantee that the answer will be correct. But that's what I'm saying. This is this this is a this is a computer limitation. 
The notion makes sense. It's a computational notation. Yeah. The notion it's a serial. It's a computational. The mathematical notation makes sense, but it's not something. It's not something you can actually provide. In the it doesn't make sense in a computational sense. You can't compute. I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah, I think so. But um, okay. your, I, but your language is making me a little unhappy. So um. <laughs> I'm a physicist. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, I saw. Oh, never mind. I'll tell you that joke later. Um, all right, where are we? I'm, I'm approaching an hour, and I've got a ways to go yet. So um, I said this was a whirlwind tour, but this is the most important part. So the, the, I'm going to get to a little bit of cool stuff, but I want to spend a little bit of time on here. So. Almost all things say, I, you know, all data types basically support EQ, and EQ is another one that you can derive. You don't have to define EQ. There's a natural definition for it that you recursively work through your data structure and things are there. You can change the definition if you'd like, but the compiler assumes that EQ is really equality, not like C++ where you're, where you're overriding a sign and doing something tricky behind the scenes. This is things. Ordinal means I can compare these two things. I can tell whether A is, you know, item one is greater than item two, okay? And that's why the sort operation says, hey, if I can compare these two items, then I know how to sort a list, right? That's all I need is to do is compare them. So if you make two matrices and you define them, at them as an instance in the class org, God help you if you do, right, because they're not, um, but if you do, then the compiler would try and faithfully do that. I mean, if you said, I'm going to sort my matrices based on the first element only or something like that. Um, but all of, the, all of the data types implemented in the language, you can go and read the headers and integers, you know, there are a few things that are done at a sort of low level, but strings and lists and trees and all these things, they just derive EQ for them. So if you look around here, you'll see numbers. I have real numbers, I have fractional numbers. I have integral numbers, I have real fractions, floatings, real floats. So the typical, the, the hierarchy of numbers, things you can do with, with each of these things are defined. You can't do multiplication on things with order only. But you can do multiplication on anything with numbers. And if you go into the type signature for these things, it'll say, what, what class you're in. So you can define these methods, you can define your functions, and you can basically go in to a lot of these things and say, well, yeah, I don't, I don't really need to be a complex, oh, complex is down here someplace too. If you really need complex numbers, then you'd say, I need complex of A, and none of those operations up there work, you're going to have to redo them all. So, But this is, the, the point is, mathematics, this, this hierarchy has been around for a long time. It's actually significantly larger than this. This was shrunk down to be practical. Um, but it's an implementation of abstract mathematics, or abstract algebra. So lambda functions, anonymous functions. This is, again, about keeping things small and powerful. The, the lambda character is represented by a backslash with the leg dropped off. So, this is, I have a function with an argument x, and it returns x times x. And the compiler will infer there that that needs to be, if you ask the type of that, it'll say, well, you're using times, and the times is, uh, the times operator requires a number, so it'll give a type in there that is restricted to being numeric types of this thing. We'll figure that out. Here are some other tricky things. Um, it's important to note that you can, you can create expressions where you have values outside. I'm going to define x to be 17. And I'm going to use it in this expression. Okay? So I'm going to say lambda y, a function with an argument y, uh, which is x times y. Well, x is 17, so I'm substituting the value 17 right there. And I'm returning a function that is y times 17 for whatever value you give it. So things outside the scope of the function are used and then they're bound inside the function when you when you return them. Okay, so that value gets caught in there, and the the result of this expression is a function that has no name, right? It's, I just built it in place. Where how do I use that? Well, here's the function up here, the square function. I just wrote it right in place. 
If I can map the square function over this list, one, two, three, and I get back to the back of the list of squares. Again, very tight, concise notation. I can operate over lists, any data structure, using little functions that I can create right on the spot. I don't great. Go create a new class in C++ with a new method and figure out where it goes and just write a little function right there. Okay? Very, very powerful. Curry. Okay, this odd notation we're doing like that here. I'm going to finally explain this. Okay? This arrow means it's a function. So, I got two functions there. So, if I take um, a function of two arguments, in Haskell, it's, you, you change it into a function that returns you another function. So I've got a value, and I, I return a value which is something of type A or A. So it's another function. So basically, instead of saying, you know, as you would say in C, I've got four arguments, and then I get a return value back, in Haskell, it would look like you have this five thin string row with these arrows in it. Let's see how that's kind of useful. Um, so I've defined a function f here, which is takes two numbers and adds them together. Right? It's got two arguments, x and y, and adds them together. And see the type, the compiler, is, or the interpreter has figured out that I've used the operator plus, and that refers to numbers, and so it's figured that out for me. So now I take f and apply it to one argument. And I get back a something that is a function that takes one number and return to another number. So I can create functions that by just giving an argument to one function and it'll, it'll do a little bit of computation and return a new thing, which is also a function. So let's see, see how that's used. Um, I can say g is f of 100. Okay, and then g is a function. I can apply it to 7 and I get back 107. It's a little line bending. It's not something you find in any other language, really. Um, but um, you can see it very nicely in sections, which are exactly this idea of curry lambda functions, but with operator. So I have the operator plus, and I can say plus 100. Well, that gives me back a function of one argument that returns another argument. So if I take 100, uh, plus 100, and I, and I give it the number 7, and it'll return me. 107. Okay, so it's a little tricky, um, but 100 plus is exactly the same as lambda x is x plus 100. So it's it's if you want to say multiple, you want to double everything in the list, you say map times two by everything in the list. You've done like that. Non tutorial. A very cool thing. Another nice little syntactic feature. You can take any function. Here's Ellen, which which is as if this thing is an element of this list. Um, and if you put it in backticks, you can use it as an infix operator instead of a prefix operator. So you don't have to go define crazy punctuation to make new operators. You just stick it in there. So you can write mathematics where your mathematics is words that you use, and you can write infix expressions for them. So if if Alan took three arguments, uh, would, would it take one and two, or does this not work? Well, if you took three arguments, you you would apply two. You apply two, and you get back a function. Yeah, uh, and curve. you need to you need to curve. Okay. Yeah, you need to structure that a little bit differently. But yeah, yeah. you could do that. Um, okay, so here's here's something that's a little hard to explain. But man, once you get used to it, you never go back on this. All of this stuff that's been leading up to these type classes, type inferred, all this being able to curry functions, put them on. This lets us stick them all together. So here's a, a lame symbol. This is the dot. Okay? It should be the little circle that goes in between functions in your math textbooks. But they picked a dot, um, and this is the type signature's Frederick filter read. It's not for me now, but when I started out, it was very difficult to read. But basically, I have a function that starts with one type and gives me another, okay? 
And now I've got another function that I want to pick up the result of that and give it over here. That's what function composition is. So I've got one function that goes from A to B, one function that goes from B to C, and I want to stick them together so I get something that goes from A to C. Like a pipe. Yes, exactly like a pipe. Except, unlike pipes in Unix, which are of one type only, this thing will let you change the types and do correct type checking for you. But there's a great deal of discussion on how to make something that will replace something like Bash, which is enormously effective, but in interactive and all these things, but using these things, and people are, are beginning to break down that sort of thing. That's one of the things we're very interesting, because we, I can give you lists of things where Bash is just the right tool to use, but it's a nightmare. Okay, so here I take two functions and I compose them, and I put them on zero, and I get back an answer. And that's, this is cosine of zero, sine of cosine of zero. Okay, here's a, uh, this is David's favorite one, and it's called Consperse. Um, it's a little tough, but, okay, so I've got a string, which is the list, right? Make me a frog. Words takes a string, and it looks for spaces, and it breaks up a string by spaces, and so I got, now I've got a list of words. Intersperse says, take a list, and everywhere you've got a comma, add a new element where I can stick this in between. So now I've got a list of words with commas in between them. But the commas are strings in that word. Well, Kitkat takes a list of strings and put them all back together. So here I've taken a space separated string and I've put it into a comma separated string using only standard list operations and functions. So, wow. Suddenly you go from looking up the operation that might do this in a big long library. I mean, you get the kind of you get the kind of behavior that Perl has with strings and just anything you want to do with a string, you can figure out how to do it in three seconds if you're really knowing Perl, which I was at one point, but I'm not anymore. Um, so, like I said, Lego lets you put these things together using standard operations. And off the um, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about lazy evaluation. <clears throat> Take we'll pull the first five values off of the list. But here's a list of one to a million. Here's an infinite list. And it just gives you the right answer back. Okay, so <laughs> how does that work? Well, the compiler does something called by need or called by name. So when you when it when it goes and it says, oh, I have got a list this list of one to a million, uh, I guess that's a hundred thousand there. Um, it doesn't actually go and fill out the whole list. What it does is create a function, which when you ask it for the head of the list, it'll give you the head of the list. And in this instance, it, this is a predefined construct. It knows, well, I've just got to give you all of it in order, so I'll just make a little function that adds one and returns you the value. <coughs> so there's some overhead associated with laziness. But on the other hand, <coughs> you can get out of certain things, and you can do some really cool stuff with it. <coughs> So here's another construct. This is the Fibonacci series. So this is Fibonacci series represented as a list. So we start with two values, 0 and 1. Those are the two seeds of our Fibonacci function. <coughs> the colons say, concatenate these guys under the front of the front of the list. Okay? Well, all of a sudden, we run out of values, and we start getting into this thing. So this thing, square bracket, some expression, a vertical bar, and a square bracket, is a list comprehension. And you see these in Python as well. Um, so what it, this is directly taken from your math textbooks. Go so look in any textbook and you will see curly brace. They define a set as the set of all x such that x is an element of this set. That's exactly what this is. So you could replace this with curly brace, vertical bar, this is an element, and that's, it's designed to represent that. But it's really a tricky little list operator. But let me just show you that this thing is defined in terms of itself, and it's determined in terms of the tail of itself, which is a list minus its head. You take the, take the head right off and give you the tail and that. Well, so a Fibonacci series, if you imagine two infinite lists, right, and you, you add them together piecewise, if you set those lists up, together correctly, then you will get a Fibonacci sequence. 
And basically, you take the two lists and you shift them down, and that's how you do that. And that's what the sh that tail does on the show. So the plus automatically sort of maps itself over the list. Yeah. The list this, yes, this is, th this thing will actually do a Cartesian product for you. That's what, th that's what this operation is doing. You could say the set of all x comma y, mm -hmm. so it's an x is in this list, y is in this list, and then give you back the Cartesian product of the list. So I just wanted to show you that this is, this is the kind of mind that Haskell comes from. They love to play with these things. But they haven't ignored the real world either. Incidentally, that's not quite standard Haskell yet. But um, they haven't ignored the, the real world, and that's the most important part, um, IO monads. <clears throat> so the downfall of all functional programming to date has been, <laughs> IO is not a value, dang it. So they turned IO into a value. And this again happened about five years after they started the language. Um, and what they did was instead of saying, I'm going to do some I.O. operation now. I don't think anybody in the room except for our friend here knows why I.O. Doesn't, doesn't make sense. Oh, so All right. Um, <laughs> that's a very good point. So let me, let me try to explain that if you take a big expression tree, you've got one big sub-expression over here, one big sub-expression on my right, one big sub-expression on my left, and you've got a big plus operator right up here. Okay? Um, any language, like C, will say, ah, I don't know which one to do first, I'll do this one first. And it evaluates this whole thing and comes up with an answer. Then it evaluates this whole thing and comes up with an answer and says, okay, now I can add those two together. And it picks which way it's going to go. If you write A plus B, and those are non-trivial expressions, both A and B, it'll pick which side one or the other. If you have side, side effects going on there, they happen in any order it wants to happen in. Whichever C picked to do A or B first, that's when those side effects will happen first. Good, like reading, side effects mean reading things. Meaning reading or writing or changing the value of a state or something like that. So, um, the, the definition of a function in mathematical terms is it should always return me the same answer for the same inputs. If you're doing I.O., that's not true. A function like getLine has no inputs, but it always returns you a different answer because it's coming from the outside world. So what we've actually done is, well, you see there's no arrow in here. So in fact, getLine in Haskell is not a function. It's a value. And it's a very specific type of value which the compiler knows about and the type system knows about. And it's designed to say, hey, what I am is something which in the outside world, when you execute me, I will give you a string back. But it doesn't actually happen now, it, what, what you do is you write an expression that says, oh, I need to evaluate these things. And you, the expression syntax orders what goes on. It's, it's a little, it's, it's kind of tricky stuff. But um, and in fact, it's the hardest thing to learn about Haskell. Uh, but it's actually fairly interesting to put them together. So oops, I didn't change this. This should be get line, and this should be put string. The whole point here is to take I.O. and represent it as something mathematical. You do this all the time in your programming. You, you use monads all the time in your programming, in effect. So for example, when you open a file, you get back a file handle, right? And you give a file handle to the uh, get character function, and it reads that file handle and gives you a character back. And that, you could, if you weren't careful about how you set things, you could read the character first and then open the file handle, right? And, and if you do this in C, if you try to put the file open right next to an ampersand and ampersand, like if I succeed in opening the file and then, then read the character, C may try and do the wrong thing to generate an error because it will try to do the, it may evaluate the thing on the right first, which depends on the thing on the left, but you didn't say that. I agree. So it won't do it for and. 
Well, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to, I'm, but <laughs> the point is, the point is, this thing gives you a string, okay? This thing takes a string and gives you back something which, when executed, will put that string out onto the outside world. And then you put them together like this, and there's no way, there's absolutely no way to get at that string without using this operator. Okay? So somebody just defined monads in terms of spaceships. Okay? So the big bad space out there is the IO of the world. And if you're in your spaceship and you're an astronaut, you can take off your spacesuit and you're in good shape. But if you want to go from one ship out into space and into another, you've got to put on your spacesuit. You've got to put yourself in a box and send yourself along in a spacesuit. Before you, and then you go into that other ship, and then you can take off the spacesuit, and then you can do normal computing. But as long as you're outside in the I.O. world, you've got to be in this box, which is called an I.O. on there. Okay? So it takes a while to learn how to do it. It takes a while to appreciate why you might be doing it. But here's the key thing. The type system is enforcing the sequencing of I.O. You basically have to explicitly say where you're doing I.O., and you can never get around that. And then what the compiler gets is a whole bunch of values that it knows how to deal with. Some of those values are things which will do, out, uh, which will do uh, output to the outside world. Some of the things will do state transformations. So um, the, the, the monads do all things, deal with all things that encapsulate state. Either the outside world, because the outside world is a state in itself, and if you got a string, then you have a string and a new outside world, which doesn't have that string on it anymore. So it takes care of all of that. And it's very nice because then the guys behind the scenes with the magic of the compiler can start changing things around. And if you change your definitions a little bit to allow for parallelism, then you can do all the I.O. you want. And it can figure out where parallelism needs to be happening. A difficult subject, like I said, not a tutorial. Uh, I saw a question back there, but I'm, all, I'm almost done here, so let me go through. And so laziness works in the I.O. world as well. Um, there's some syntactic sugar for working with I.O. monads. So this almost looks like imperative programming, and it's designed to, do, to look exactly like that. So you can do I.O. in a purely functional way, but um, it looks like, well, I'm going to read a file and put it into the value of x, and bind it to the value of x, and then I'm going to put this string out. Well, I might have obviously wanted to say put string on x, um, and that's how you would do cat, for example. If, if I replaced hello world here with x, that would be cat, the, the, the Unix command cat. In this case, I neglected to use x, so the laziness took over, and I never actually read this big file, I just put out the hello world. So the laziness, if you use it correctly, can do some optimization for you. Then you can, you can <coughs> set up all these values to be computed, but if you never demand them, then they'll never happen and they'll just get tossed away. So the IO monad helps you sort all that stuff out. Okay? Except in the case of using reading a really big file to delay the processing <laughs> the string out of words. Yes, that's true. Um, so practicality, I remember I said that the the, the the Haskell people were not just interested in mathematics, they're interested in real world stuff. And there's a lot of real world language support going on. Why don't this quick check? You can give it a function. Give it a function that you wrote, you can write a little thing that says, here's a property of this function in terms of Boolean. So for example, reverse is supposed to reverse a list. If you reverse a list twice, it should give you back the identity function. Um, so uh, this little quick check thing is about 300 lines of code. It'll generate random values for that. And if none of them satisfy the property, then it'll toss it back out. It's trivial to use, catches a whole bunch of bugs just like that. HUNIT is a sort of more production kind of thing. For user-defined tests, you can just make a big test suite of values that you want to go through, and then run it as you build your package. Uh, Cabal is uh, a packaging, it's an autoconf replacement, it's sort of standard tool now for, you got your Haskell library, you want to put it out there, Cabal is supposed to help you with that. Um, top of the charts. Debian has a site where they do, they have like 20 programs that are test suites for efficiency on the language. And Haskell people, they didn't really, the, the programs are very odd. 
And some, at one point recently, they realized they were down around number 10 and they got pissed off. And so we started optimizing those programs and they zipped right up to the top of the chart. So if you pay attention, if you understand the language, you can make it as efficient as anything else, okay? Fast pack strings, I'll show you more about that in a minute. This book, uh, Okasaki's Purely Functional Data Structures, if you're into data structures, this is a must read. It's all about amortization. Um, and it's a really interesting thing. A growing community with Haskell. Um, like I said, there's like 150 people on there, on the IRC channel every day, and the language is continuing to develop in a very careful way. Um, and they, they limit it. The fast pack strings, ooh, I didn't get this, I still didn't get it in. All right. So the fast pack strings was recently done. Remember it said strings are lists? Well, it's a little inefficient when you start getting up to big files. So this guy in Australia, as a student, started writing these things. Ah, oh, I'm going to try to make gigabyte files. Unacceptable performance. He started writing the fast pack string library, and he's got a one-line version of WC, which runs just as fast as this version in C. But it's, you know, it's like this many characters. I'm sorry, I don't have it here. I lost it. Um, but it just processes gigabytes of data. This is kind of like uh, ropes, like C, the ropes and C. Um, yes. Yes. In fact, yes. It might be done internally the same. Um, and in fact, one of the Google Summer of Code projects is to take the fast pack strings and implement exactly ropes. So the point is, we have this lovely mathematical definition of strings. It's a little inefficient. Somebody's gone in. All the same operations used on strings work on the fast pack strings. So you can use them almost interchangeably. But they're fast. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, the point of this next three slides is so simple. People look at, have looked at languages like C, and well, I can't express my problem in a small enough, it's too much overhead working with C to say work with, well, hence the invention of block to work with these things. So these are two examples of. Um, of recent things that people have put out. Um, Haskell is a markup language. Using some very tricky type definition stuff, this guy Oleg made a little thing so you can write things that look exactly like HTML, but they're actually Haskell code, and they're type checked. So if you were to reverse like the head and the body, for example, that would be an invalid construction, and the Haskell thing would, would, would push it back to you. So, you can actually write what looks like HTML. It's code. It's statically checked, type checked, and uh, so it's a little language all by itself. But you don't have to rebuild the whole language yourself. You just write some type systems and off you go. So there's some cool work going on there. This is um, a, a grep that's about 20 lines long, using some pattern matching that, that this guy wrote. You know, the five most valuable features of grep can you implement it is that. You turn it into fast pack strings and it's as fast as grep. Actually, I'm not certain about that one. It's, it's close. Um, but the point is the language is so, it worked on the expression of code so much that they can get these things down there where you're not tempted to go to another language if you're willing to put enough time. Haskell.org, if, if I've excited you, is the place to go. Um, there are mailing lists and there's IRC channels. Both there's one called Haskell Cafe um, and the IRC channel. They're all very newbie friendly. If you just go in there and be polite, um, it's one it's uh, one of the most civil places on the planet. Um, and you can, and you'll get a lot of help as long as they don't think you're you know trying to get a homework problem answered. Um, but the guy who did the fast pack strings, I was on the IRC channel one night, and somebody came in and said, Hey, I'm using the fast pack strings, but you didn't define these three functions for me. He said, well, I didn't think they were needed. And the guy said, well, here's what I was trying to do. He said, oh, well, you're right, they're totally needed. He said, well, OK, map is done. OK, this one's done. This one's done. And then he put out a darts repository for the guy to go and pull the code from. Five minutes later, he had these three very important functions that were in additions to the library. So. I don't know. It has the feel to me that we can actually make headway. Working in Linspire for four or five years, I feel like the same thing is going on all over the planet. 
working with people reworking the same little core things, and we still don't have, we're just barely getting good photo editors, barely. And you still people find find people rebuilding GCC and switching from this language to that and making this new little tool to a different version of Make. And ever since switching to Haskell, I started writing things that work. The full range of functional programming going on inside there. If you want to convert from one format to another in sequence and values and back in terms of your data structure, all that goes on inside the IOM one ad. The whole point is that if I do IO, I give it to you wrapped in a box. And you can't get that box. You can't get it the value inside the box unless you promise to pass a box on to the next guy. Anything else you want to do that object inside that box and pass it on to another box? Absolutely, you may do. I'm not sure I've completely understood where the misconnection is there, but but. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's very deterministic and very powerful, and there's no there's no randomization there. Like, hey, for instance, if I were reading a file of numbers, yeah, how do I get a number out of this string? Um, well, I mean, one way is to I mean, you you your parser would return you I/O strings. You would make a function which took a string and converted it to a number. Return dot read. Uh, yeah, there's actually a function. Um, I don't have. I don't have my interpreter on here. Um, uh, there's a function called read, which is the inverse of show, basically. So show takes an integer and gives you a string back. Read will give you um, a, a string and give you back the value. So you would compose. <laughs> you would you would compose get string and you put it in something in here. Um, and actually, this is what. This is what this thing does. Um, the, the return function lets you take something and put it back in the box. Are, so, are you then back at runtime checking? No. So, so well, I mean, yeah, yeah. You cannot do you cannot do static type checking on on data that's out in the world. But you can insist that the read function guarantees that it takes a string and returns you an integer. And it will complain and throw an error, an exception, if if it was not given something that was a valid representation of an integer. Um, and after that point, it guarantees that it will only return integers, and off you go from there. But okay, but to some extent, I think the confusion I'm guessing is because your example is about strings because they're important. I mean, you could do bi I assume you could do binary I/O in Haskell. Yes. Yes. Right. Yep. So I think the point is is that he was talking about strings because they're kind of common and important. But you could be pulling other things out of yeah. out of that. I mean, not that I actually understand these things, but the problem they're trying to solve has nothing to do with strength. The problem they're trying to solve is that the same value doesn't come back. So even if you're doing binary I.O., it's just different binary strings come back. You're sure. still you're still getting characters. So I'm I'm trying to look at this and compare it to C or C plus plus and see where some of these concepts actually leverage into things just working and it seems as though you're dealing with the same types of problems. Uh, you, know, you have to know the implementation or I mean you yes. look in you cannot get around parsing. There's no magic around parsing. I mean if you if you at runtime your program goes out and parses some data and brings it back in, you have to deal with the fact that the data might be not be what you expect. There's there's no but in the same way that I would package up some object to be you know, speed out numbers. Right. So, so you modularize yeah. regardless of the language. So right. it's, a lot of these things look like force modularization. Right. And the force hierarchy of you know, the data types. Right. Now, now I mean, the, the problem you're talking about basically is marshalling and unmarshalling of, of data, data structures automatically. That's not provided by the language, but there are libraries that address that issue. And so they use these mechanisms to try and get the right answers back in those instances. Um, but there was actually a recent discussion on the Haskell list about how much you can, I mean, how much you can control the outside world and how valuable it is. I mean, and one of the one of the founders was saying, well, the lovely things is once you get inside the program, then it's all predictable. But as soon as you deal with the outside world again, well, then you've got to you've got to deal with the outside world. 
Um, and I, I, I couldn't figure out why this disturbed me so much, but the answer was that um, that's really only true insofar as the kernel is providing you uh, and, and CPU and memory controller are sort of providing you this nice memory space and that nobody else has access to. But I mean, you, if you try and do these things on file systems, you may run one program, you may have created the file out there and, and, and you say, oh, well, I know that file was there, I just created it. You run some other program and you come back and you get that file and it's gone. And the outside world, I mean, that's really true of your memory space as well. It just doesn't happen very often. You can just uh, ignore that and keep going. Is this a really serious requirement? Of no, 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 that's, no, that's quite right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Just while you check. I mean, I, I mean, I would recommend it personally, but, um, <laughs> but it's not a requirement. Any other questions? So, since yeah. you were talking about efficiency, yeah, has anybody attempted to implement, uh, let's say, a uh, fast Fourier or fast Rayleigh transform natively in Haskell and and looked at them? I'm not sure about a fast Fourier transform. Because there's, there's some linear on that. You can't do anything. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> the answer is if you're willing to forego a lot of the nice little things you've got, Simon Peyton Jones, one of the founders, says that Haskell is the finest imperative language in the world. Uh, honestly, you can make it spit well, out very, very efficient C code if you like, if you want to. Well, okay, so what I'm, what I'm kind of getting at is that there's, there, there's a forgotten, there's a forgotten group of people who write most of the world's research papers for whom uh, C++ is not, I and mean, I have a friend I talk regularly to who still doesn't use C++ because he can get 10% faster code in Fortran. So that's the, I, I, you know, yeah, I'm curious, yeah, yeah. I'm right. just curious no, no, what I, happens when you do that, or no camel, which has a reputation for, for producing very efficient code. Yeah, so, but, but still Fortran, Fortran is a special niche in that they have well, a lot of the, the mathematical operations. Well, it is, but um, they've screwed it up recently. And there's a huge, there's now, he and I just said, there is now an opportunity for a language which is higher performance than Fortran, thanks to the recent actions of the committee. Uh, um, weirdly enough. I, I, would say, I would say absolutely, I would expect Haskell to win in the end on this subject. One of the reasons is parallelism. Um, and if you if you structure if you if you're careful enough about structuring the computation and your data, the you can go work go to the parallel versions of GHC and, and try and get some parallels. The, the, reason, the, reason so the reason I ask is I would have guessed the opposite way. I would have guessed that laziness basically would, is what would kill you. Because well, I mean, we my, already know the language actually know. provides for getting rid of the laziness if you really want to. So there's a there's an operator operator called seek. Which will force yeah, evaluation yeah, now. Version okay. it, was, it was actually quite controversial to put in, but a lot of people demonstrated instances where, <laughs> hey, these are sort of dual problems, right? Um, you sometimes you, you want to read all your data, in, sometimes you don't. But if you if you if you pay the cost of reading it in lazily, when you know in fact that the entire thing's got to come whipping through. I assume that well, what's happening under the hood is you're creating a thunk and, yes. and blah blah blah. Right. That's what I'm saying is is that for that class of program, <coughs> essentially, it, it's essentially a, a, a you know people will go crazy. Oh my God, I created a thunk and I I got a I got a cache mix. Yeah, but that's I mean that's a yeah. but that's well it's very specialized. I'm just curious a, though since you were talking about performance, I'm just yeah. curious what happens when you sort of put it in this weird specialized arena and you know. uh, um people I don't know what the competitive numbers are. People have written some linear algebra things. I think basically. It hasn't been used for doing any of these big, serious number crunching things yet. Um, which is why, in fact, operating system stuff is actually fairly small stuff, you know. So, oh, yeah, it's um, and where you, where you care about being able to read it cleanly and 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 get and be correct and not let a lot of errors in. And, and actually, if you, um, we know from some of our experience at Microsoft, look at in there the installer code for a lot of these things. We worked with the wine people for quite a while. Um, every time the installer goes to put something on your system, it will double and triple check whether the file exists, whether the directory exists. There are all these redundancy checks in there to deal with what we were talking about there about the outside world will change underneath you. Um, and, and that's where you want some mechanisms to help you. you know, <laughs> hey, did I get these correct? There's some more advanced tricks that we've been thinking about for 
using the types to represent the expected state of the system. And if we go and there's an error, then we say, well, then we gotta unravel this set of assertions we've got and tell you what went wrong. And we run into this all the time when we write big scripts that do a whole bunch of stuff and make a mistake. Go find this file and, ah, oh, it's not there anymore. What if, you know, you're 1,500 lines into this big complicated script, how do you figure out what went wrong? Well, being able to represent the training assumptions that you had rolling and roll that back out and print out some XML that might tell you what's going on would be a really good thing. So uh, on the number crunching, I don't know yet, but theory says this stuff is going to win out. Well, okay, so, the, so the, re the reason I sort of think of this in this arena at all is because the best, uh, the best non-proprietary FFT implementation is uh, FF, you know, you know what it is. It's the one that on the West. Yeah. Which is, which, which is <laughs> written <laughs> in C by an OCaml program. Right. So what I found interesting is, is, that, is that they still had to write it to C, but they're using OCaml to generate it, yeah, which is I, interesting. I, I, w I would think you would not, you would probably want to generate a Haskell program, but you probably not have to write it to see if you're careful about it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that was kind of my, you know, that was kind of what interested me, you know. Um, there's a few points there on there. Um, so floating point performance hasn't really been a serious goal of, you know, yeah. the optimization backends and the compilers. You probably don't want to try and write that code. Um, all this laziness stuff, that is something that the optimizer works really hard at figuring out when it's not necessary yeah. to do this stuff. I mean, it would, ha it would have to, essentially. It. It's, it's yeah. actually getting pretty clever about doing that. Yeah. Um, I, I also ask these questions because I always laugh. I always laugh when the Haskell people talk about mathematics because they also mean a very restricted set of mathematics. Yeah, they mean Haskell algebra for the most part. Well, they also, they also mean, they also mean a lot of category. Well, they also mean discrete, discrete math. And yeah. those of us who spent, you know, most of our lives doing continuous math, it's, it's interesting, and, and it's just not something, these, these are people who don't talk to each other. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. They do the kind of math that mathematicians Yes. Actually, <laughs> actually, no, that's not, that's not even true. They do the kind of math that computer scientists that have mathematician envy like. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, okay. right. Anyway. Uh, hey, Euler was a mathematician, yeah. let's not forget. It, it's, I mean, there are certainly problems that we do not recommend people tackle with Haskell right at this point. I certainly do not recommend that, uh, you know, I don't expect that, that uh, uh, everybody's going to take the Haskell. But uh, the story I've been telling recently is, uh, I mean, I was the youngest of four brothers. Um, and when I was six, my oldest brother was 13, my grandmother said, hey, look, we got a bridge quartet here. And she taught us all how to play bridge. So I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't know how to play bridge. And as I was growing up, most of my friends had never heard of bridge, much less knew how to play. And a lot of adults were completely blown away by the fact that I knew how to play bridge. But I had no clue that this was anything that I was too young to learn, so I had just learned it. Um, I never became a bridge master, but two of my brothers went on to go for it uh, pretty aggressively at various times. Um, but I learned it young enough that a lot of the other games that came around, hearts, spades, whists, Euchre, Canasta, some of you would say, oh, do you know how to play you know, this game? And I'd say, well, no, and, but go ahead and teach me, you know? And, and they'd say, well, this, uh, this is a trick, and, and, and you know, and this is a term that you, I'm like, I don't know what a trick is, that's fine. And most of those games are all subsets of bridge in one way or another, or variants thereof. If you know bridge, the auctioning is in whist, the trumps are in spades, but only one suit, and they're all just subsets of it. And so I had this roadmap to put everything on. Well, as I progressed through all the languages, Haskell came around and I said, ah, here's Bridge. And this is a game you can play for a very long time if you're willing to devote the, the, the time to it, basically. It's not trivial to learn, but That's the good. IRC That's channels and the, and the tutorials are all getting better. People are writing tutorials every other day, it seems like. I didn't understand this bit, so I wrote a tutorial for it. And there's a big wiki and you can add to it. Yeah, I know. I know there's that, which is very good. But eventually, eventually they're going to have to actually. Eventually, they're actually going to have to get to the point where they have. Uh, they have a small. They have a small number of ones that they're pointing people to. Yeah. That was one of the problems. Actually, is 
that when I looked at it, there were too many tutorials. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> which right. means that you can't. Which means that, that yeah. almost certainly the tutorial you need is there, but you'll never find it. And that's and that's so. why the the IRC channel can be a really good thing. You go and you just pick a particular topic and write a little thing. Go out to the IRC channel and get some help on it. You can move things along. The cafe is per precisely for this purpose. So you can say, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to represent my fast query trip from. I don't care about speed right now. How do these arrays work? And uh, people will type. Um, this is the purely functional data structures by Chris Okazaki. This is his PhD thesis. Um, this will open your eyes on, on data structures in a big way, in many ways, and certainly about purely functional ones. Um, and this is Paul Hudak. He's one of the founders of the thing. He teaches you Haskell by, by uh, using a little graphics library, and you can do some animation. And with a little work, that graphics library still works today. It's distributed with compilers and stuff. There are a couple of other books out there now too, which are good as well. So are there good bindings to write uh, KDE or GNOME programs in Haskell? There's a G, there are GTK bindings, but GUI stuff is one of the messiest things out there. Um, and there's some really cool research projects done in, 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 I was actually in research in GUI stuff, and then I was just thinking about this stuff, and then Hudak came out with something called Fran, which basically incorporates time as a first class variable into a little language to do animation really, really nice, but Microsoft locked up the code, in, so. Um, so I think they did. Um, but the, um, there's bindings for GTK and for WX, uh, the WX widget set, and then there's this third sort of graphics library. But we have looked at KDE bindings. We may do it when we get time. It's fairly nasty the way Python does it. The, the, the libraries that Python generates for their binding to the C++ are larger than KDE itself. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, impressive because I actually compile KDE. Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's uh, basically for every method in every level of every class, they generate a little wrapper function. And then they call that. Yeah, I mean, it's just, your memory just goes hmm, out the door. Why did my system get so slow? Wow, this stuff is interpreted fast. Except for that library it has to load. So uh, the bindings could be that better. That's not Python. So, um, mm -hmm. other questions? Didn't understand anything. Did understand something. Thought it was cool. Didn't care a whit. Really wanted to see a demo of CNR. Um, Free Spire is going to be released this summer. GCI. GCI is the interpreter. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So I can demonstrate a little bit of this. Um, That's very, my version of click and run. <laughs> Set up the network first. <laughs> um, the very first thing you do in GCI is say colon help. And it tells you all of the colon commands which you can use to be, which you use to operate things, which there's no equivalent of that in the OCaml interpreter, which is why I was always frustrated with it. Um, but then you can, the most important thing is you can just dynamically load modules by saying colon module plus data, oops, data dot string, say. There's not a module and you don't have it installed. Right. There's, no, there's no such module. There's no such module ever. There we go. <laughs> uh, so if that adds it in. You can put a minus in there to remove it back out. You can mix and match and get all the modules in there. And we'll show you what your prompt is. And then you can do things. So you can start playing around. And you can say, OK, what's the type of, say, the plus operator? Well, let's type AAA with a numeric thing on it. Mm -hmm. Just go off and play right there. Um, another, I, I sort of glossed over this, but another thing that we really like about this is Haskell is very, very, I mean, this, this colon M thing, it's the syntax you use inside the interpreter, but other than that, you use just exactly the module syntax that you use um, in the code itself. If you write a little bit of code, you can say, Pull and load that little bit of code and pulls it in and off you go. There's very little difference between the interpreted world and the compiled world. It's a very seamless transition. OCaml, okay, well, that's not the case. You have to stay it on your head and kind of make things go. Um, and it's much more like Steam or something where they, they really got that seamless transition very nice. How do they deal with binding with external languages? Um, the GHC, the Glasgow Haskell compiler, um, has uh, 
both a library for generating things, uh, for generating bindings for more complicated things called um, Haddis, or they're all established names from a uh, green card was the, was the thing, and there's another one that was done. But these days you can just say, oh, here's a foreign function for C, and off you go, and there are lots of examples of how to do it. That was another thing they paid attention. Um, I was at a meeting where in, I don't know, the mid 90s about there where they were saying, look, we keep writing all these cool languages and nobody keeps, nobody uses them. And, and so they did, they took, Phil Wilder took a poll and saying, why aren't you guys using it? And I said, well, I got about a million lines of code over here and you want me to rewrite it in a language which, which you know, I'd love to play with that language, but what I want to do is work on my problems because I got a million lines of code. So that was another reason Haskell was a, a, uh, a point where everybody working on these, these languages and theories could, not everybody, but a lot of people could come together and what they do is, hey, I've got this proposal for a new type system over here. And they implement it as an extension to GAC and they put it out there for people to use. And then people use it and comment on it for a long time. And then the committee comes back and says, well, this one we think is really nailed right now. And so we're going to add it into the standard. So there's this funneling process that works quite well. Um, record structures, structures that we have in C, there's no good equivalent of that in Haskell. There are several implementations of them. You have tuples, but you don't have named structures where you can say, you know, the first element is a string and it's got a name of X, and the second element is a string and it's got a name of Y, or you know, integer. Um, but you don't suffer for it because you have all these other things until perhaps you get to the big real world of coding, you know, maybe you've got to deal with X structures or something like that. Um, but there's no way to sort of wedge it into the type system nicely, so they haven't done it yet. They're working on it. Lots of people have proposed things, but the numbers come up with a proposal that everybody agrees is correctly correct yet. They all agree that they really need this stuff in there, but it's not quite there yet. But I, I have <coughs> almost never attempted to use a record structure these days. There actually is, is something in that that will generate access or functions from on a tuple with names and look like a record. Right. But they're still arguing over that. It's non-standard. <laughs> That's a Glasgow Haskell extension. There are several others that are still under that are still under proposal. So you can't rely. I mean, if you're trying to write code, it's going to live forever. That's the wrong thing to do at this point. But they're going to come up with something, so it'll be pretty close. But that's kind of the way it works. I mean, it, it's also the licensing on it. They're they're very very strict they, about making sure that everything, absolutely everything, is is BSD style licensing on it. Um, down to the point where they had a discussion about the wiki and the license you have to agree to when you contribute stuff to the wiki. Um, so you have to, you can't put copyrighted code in, or text into the wiki for Haskell. So, uh, so in terms of open source, they're they're really quite good. Do they have something equivalent to CPAN for the you know, modules? Yes. Um, there's a hierarchical module system. I don't know all the features of CPAN, but the libraries, the, the current set of standard libraries plus the extended ones is getting to the point where a lot of people will go out and read the CPAN libraries and say, oh look, the CPAN ones has this Gregorian calendar and these better data structures over here, and they, they, they start re-implementing them. Somebody actually made something that would call out the CPAN libraries, um, but nobody really <laughs> picked up on that. I think they, they couldn't stay in getting Perl all over the Haskell code. So, um, uh, but the, the libraries are getting more and more extensive all the time. You're talking and they're, like they're going out and hierarchically structured. Sorry, go ahead. If you're talking like going out and downloading stuff. There's nothing that does that yet, but. Well, actually, that's on, that. on my so final page. We're we're talking, point, so we're you're going to find the stuff in, in right. Well, uh, one of the things we're trying to do is all these libraries that get out, uh, for us, getting them in a Debian package means we can just go whack and install them all. Uh, we're trying to set up cron jobs so within, when the latest versions are released, we use Cabal, generate a Debian package, and make it go in there. And so you can just use the Debian system to have to get your new version of it, and off you go. So we're, we're trying to we're trying to make that happen so that so that those things are always available. It'd be several months yet, I think. But so so as a almost totally change subject, how many Debian packages do you guys end up having to be the be the uh, uh, maintainers for? Um, 
Well, nothing that Debbie maintains, because they obviously do it Fair. themselves. Obviously. We've just, created, a, I don't know, we've created several hundred of our own, I'm sure. Of greatly have, varying complexity. Some of them are little configuration operations which go here and there. Some of them are our own version of Firebird and Thunderbird, which are packaged up with uh, customizations. Uh, CNR has about 10 for itself. Um, well, let me put it this way. Are, are, is anybody evinced by a, a DD so that you maintain it in Debian so you don't have to just maintain it? Um, no, uh, although one person is about to become so. Um, but that's part of the goal with FreeSpark. It, it takes a lot of effort to get something back to Debian in a form that they'll be willing to accept. I mean, a lot of our earlier stuff was just rip this stuff out and you know put some Linspire branding on it and off we go. Um, we've over time we've gotten less frantic because Michael was in a very big hurry to get stuff out in the beginning. Um, we've gotten more organized and a lot of this Haskell stuff there is now a guy named John Gorson whose name you've probably seen on Slashpad for arguing about the Java license. He's uh, he's the pre he's the president of the or part of the corporation that sort of represents legal entities. That is a legal entity. When Debbie needs a legal entity, this corporation is supposed to handle it. And he's arguing with the Debbie project leader about oh, yeah, right. the whole, yeah, the whole so, is this yeah. the thing? Is this the thing where the, where the, I think it was just today, I noticed the Debbie project leader like, yeah. said, do you, do you not, we could just walk away from that. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's yeah. the argument going on. Well, John, in, in his other world, has migrated from Python to OCaml to Haskell, and has now written his rewritten a lot of his Debian tools in Haskell, and we're planning to take a lot of like our auto builder and stuff and funnel them back to Debian through him, um, which gives us an advocate on that side who is both Debian and Haskell, and he's kind of excited about that. Plus, there's um, um, several other Debian developers are big Haskell fans, and we're on a mailing list with them about getting, getting the packaging up to date, current, keeping it current. Um, we're trying to work with them to get that stuff done. So, We've been a little insular often because we felt, I mean, we felt we couldn't, you know, make the promises to Debian that, you know, anybody as a Debian developer would want them to make. With FreeSpire, we think we can do that, so we're moving more for that direction. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the how you deal with the ongoing challenge of merging your, your changes back into each new release. Yeah, um, some, some time ago we, we uh, about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, we got fed up with CBS. Um, uh, and Debian works, has a mechanism to all in place for Debian to use, but if you're, you know, they've got upstream and then Debian sits downstream and they catch all the software and they apply all these patches and re reapply them. And we're sitting downstream of Debian, so there's a double layer and their mechanisms don't recurse. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, we looked around at source code control systems and we settled on ARC TLA, um, which is, like Haskell, has a fairly steep learning curve. Not, not Darks, so. huh? Darks was really, really raw at the time. Darks still does not have a lot of things that a real world commercial developer will need. For example, if you put in a Debian package and you check it out, the rules file, which is the make file for the package, will not run because the executable bit has been turned off on it doesn't preserve that. So there are a lot of things where, where TLA treated the metadata on the file to be the same as the data in the file. If you change that, it records that and puts it in there. Darks doesn't do that. Darks doesn't keep full histories. Darks doesn't have quite a lot of other things. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it seems to be a very hard problem that nobody really paid any attention to a long time, for a long time. Uh, the, the people have partitioned off in, in about thirds. Git does some really amazing stuff and it's getting better and it's encroaching on these things, but there are a lot of things it doesn't ignore and doesn't, you know, Linus created it to do what he wanted to do in a hurry and that's other people sort of, you know, moving along. Darts is great if you're doing a developer on upstream code, I uh, mean, it's fabulous. It's got like eight commands. Um, everything's symmetric, everything's pure. It was written by a physicist. Yes, I, um, I, 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 I know, I know. I love, I, it's the only place I've seen quantum operators. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you should use quantum operators for everything. Why yeah. not? <laughs> um, and TLA, TLA sort of takes the patch management to a, a, a really high level. Um, 
And TLA is, in, in so many ways, purely functional in that you, yeah. you submit a patch to the server and you're not allowed to really modify what's on the server. It's, it's, like, it's like Chris Tokosaki is purely functional data structures. Um, it's quite powerful. It takes, the UI is not the real strong point. The command line, there are like 100 commands, which take quite a long time to learn. Um, and, it's, and it's buggy. Um, and, and Tom Lord got into a flame war with, with Canonical over taking sort of, they sort of hijacked it from him and got really bitter about them. And then he got sick and then, so. Um, it, but at the time, as one of our colleagues said, it sucked the least in terms of source code control systems. We think it's still an unsolved problem. We're limping along with TLA. Um, one of the things we're using Haskell for, so we can rewrite some of these tools, so that maybe we can say, just get me all these packages. Look, I've got this bug to work on. Get me all these packages, because the bug spans 15 packages. Hack, 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 hack. Push this thing up. Please figure out where that patch should go someplace up on the server. And give it to the release manager who will figure out what to do it. Um, so we, we're, the, that's what we're trying to make things simple for the outside world to just say, look, I, I see there's a bug here, and I don't even know how to fix the bug. But what I want to do is submit to you a, you know, a diff in the output of your program. And here's what your hardware detector generated. And here's the freaking option that needs to go to the third paragraph of my XR.conf. And here's the diff. Please make your detector do this on my machine. We have all the components in place to do that pretty much. We can take a snapshot of your machine and have you send it back up to them. And David often sorts that stuff out. Um, or <laughs> uh, but you know, we're still configuring X servers after I went to the second X conference in 1986. That's just way too freaking long to not have solved the problem of how to bring up an X a window system on a video card, in my opinion. And it's just yeah. it's no, terrible. Uh, That's what I mean to this core set of stuff. It's just all broken. And <coughs> it's broken because we're all the people who use it. We all know how to fix it. It's like, oh, well, that fell off the top there. Yeah, never mind. I'll just put it right back there. You didn't see that. You know, I mean, and, and well, X, X is a special case. No, X no, it's really, it's really not. It's really completely not a special case. Software is very hard. Getting software to the point where it works mostly, where you can tell something, you just how to get it right in there, is pretty easy. Getting it to always do the correct thing down the line in a heterogeneous, complex world is not easy. It takes an awful lot more effort. X wasn't developed for like 10, 15 years. That's kind of special. <laughs> X was in deep maintenance mode for. Yeah, time. but. <laughs> but that should have made it easier in theory. Yeah. Well, no, because it was in deep maintenance but mode it's, and it's, deep broken state. But look, there's, there's all kinds of active <laughs> things like USB like drivers, software suspended resume. All these things, they all break repeatedly. Sure. Of course, they have terrible things to deal with. They have BIOSes to deal with that come from random manufacturers and have all kinds of bugs in them. Um, the standard way, if your laptop doesn't come up with the right resolution to fix that, is to get somebody to hack the video BIOS and put the freaking right modes that are supposed to be in there for your LCD panel, and then you write that video BIOS back in every time you boot. Mm -hmm. And that's just totally lame, because the manufacturer was not following the specs that Intel gave them. Intel has now instituted a program, actually, where they're trying to follow their equipment all the way out to the end of the line to make sure that you can get a piece of hardware and software together that's working together. They're working now closely with the ALSA people, the kernel people, and the X people. You so a reference driver will actually work? Yeah. Yeah, and, provide, and provide the reference drivers before the product is released, not after. I mean, this is this is why everybody else in the world, from Apple on, has always wanted to be vertically integrated. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but if but I think by I dream. Let me, let me say that I dream by by uh, by with these techniques, we can start putting some. A next level of reliability into those things, um, and and make it so that you don't have such carelessness going on in your code. I mean, the, the fact that we the fact that you have to install a Linux system and then configure it, it's totally lame. And we try. I mean, you know, when we're doing our jobs, the Linspire installs and it just comes up, and I set the caps lock key to be a control key, and then I'm ready to go. All right, I 
install a few other things, main pages and compilers. But I don't have to, I don't have to find the USB drivers, I don't have to find the, if we're, if we're not finding those things, it's a bug, basically. Um, there was some other thing I was going to say. Oh, right, did you all see there was a new announcement for a new grep? Lots of new features in grep. They sort of yeah. integrated it with find. There are all these new features. Man, I'm going to, if I get, if I get a weekend where I got nothing to do, I'm going to sit down and rewrite that whole freaking thing in Haskell. Mm -hmm. And I think David's written three quarters of it already for the detector for traversing trees and all this other kind of stuff. I bet we can re-implement that thing in much less code um, with much more clarity uh, and in a very short amount of time. I think it would be a really interesting challenge. But a lot of the GNU stuff, I think, is, you know, I've grown up revering it. But um, the more I actually have to work with this stuff, <laughs> the less I like it. And Bash, a wonderful thing. I've done amazing things with Bash, but you know, I'm finding I'm finding more power here. It's it's, it's still young, it's still raw, but I'm finding more power here. And it's 9:15, two hours after I started, and I'll go on as long as you like. But <laughs> you don't seem hungry and you don't seem impatient, so mm -hmm. just but let me know when I should shut up. So go ahead. With infrastructure that you set up, you had you had some. You know, this very complicated system, and you need to be able to look at the state of, dip, of a whole subset, well, of some subset of this. You have some mechanism for describing what parts of this system. Well, you, actually, the web actually, director was bugging me today about whether I write up the release notes on the meeting for which we were doing that. So, um, since somebody asked about source code control, um, TLA has this, like I said, this sort of functional tree model of source code in which you can you can basically you apply patches to a linear branch and you can you know a linear line and you can branch off but at some point you can say just tag this thing back over here and this thing you know exactly what was over there that's now the head over here. So you don't have to worry about merging in that operation. It's just it's a direct replacement. It's you know this thing is now exactly this. Well Debian has this structure of a big tree of packages, all of these interleaved dependencies. There are two sets of dependencies. There's the build time dependencies, all the packages you need to build and compile your program, or whatever package it is, whether it's a program or not. And then there are the runtime dependencies. So you have these two interlinking sets of things, which are cyclical. David's been finding this for a week now, uh, trying to rebuild these things. If you actually run around these build dependencies, they're cyclical, and they will <laughs> you will build your packages forever unless you fix that. And it's not exactly, um, and unless you, you break the cycles explicitly, it's not exactly clear which order it should be built in. But Debian does this by hand. Um, a maintainer is responsible for noticing that his build dependencies have changed, they have been uploaded to the repository, he's supposed to fix any bugs and, and re-upload it himself. We're, and they have an auto builder as well, and they've got some of the stuff, but they don't publish these tools, they don't clean them up for the outside world so much. And so, David's been working on a version in Haskell, and uh, Jeremy Shaw has been working on a dependency engine, trying to set, sort some of these things out. So now you have the problem, we always had this problem. For example, David, the, the terrible thing about working on the detector is, you get anything wrong, everybody stops. Because, it, you know, it's like he puts a bug into the code, this is why we like static type checking, right? Put a runtime error into the code, Somebody goes through the whole process of installing a new OS on their system and comes up and it, and it throws an error when it's reading from the USB drive or whatever, and your whole system just, and everybody curses David because, ah, the thing is always breaking the system. Well, nothing works unless the detector comes through. So it's like your kernel. If your kernel is screwed up, then nothing's going to work. And so it's a real hot point. So getting it correct is where we leverage a lot of this stuff. Um, so that means, but we don't have full control over everything, right? You're pulling in new drivers from NVIDIA, new drivers from ATI, which are binary, new modem drivers, or new kernel patches. Some guy is swearing now that this is the greatest kernel patch in the world. You put it on five systems and it'll just break horribly, right? So being able to go back to the state of where things were yesterday, but pulling the changes that these five guys made, but not this detector set of changes is a fairly challenging problem. But I realized one day, using TLA, that is exactly the problem that TLA solves. 
you have this little extra problem of having to rebuild all these packages and make sure that their dependencies are right. But in essence, you say, okay, there's the state of the world as it is now. I'm going to grab that, build my packages over here for a while until I get them right, test them. Then I want to go back and say, did anybody change the world? If not, then I'm going to take this thing and tag it. So exactly the distribution I was testing over here is exactly what goes back over here. If the world did change, then I need to import those changes and decide whether I need to rebuild any of my packages and then retag it back. So we're building a system, and I'm trying to define the semantics of that merging and when it's safe to, when it's safe to not rebuild packages, we're all working on that together so that we can efficiently keep this tree of everybody works independently. You can work on your stuff. You can get updates from the server whenever you want to. And then when you're ready, you can send back your changes. But QA will be testing exactly what you have been working with, which is not the case in our current system. It's not the case with the web database. So it sounds like it's actually system-wide version control instead of just an application specific system. Yeah, it's the meta version problem. And then what do you do when you have some package that hasn't been ported to the new libraries that came out or something like that? And now you have mismatches and Yeah, that's that's the problem you face in the world of Linux where everybody's on a different release schedule. Um, you either bite the bullet and update the package yourself or toss it out of the disk or mm -hmm. wait for the next thing to come around. Is. Yeah. Um, and there would be there would be some some features I'd love to put in the CNR to say, um, and there are some, some things we could do that, that we're looking at. For example, you can install some things into change routes and run them out of change routes. So as long as the protocol of the windowing system hasn't changed, you can do that. That usually X is fine, KDE is not because the KDE libraries will have been updated and two things may or may not run. Something out of KDE. <coughs> will definitely not run with KDE4, for example. So, um, But um, there's also UnionFS, which allows you to overlay these file systems. Um, uh, one of the things we're looking at is to make CNR. I mean, you get errors in your packaging, and if you get an error in the detection package and installs and breaks halfway through, it takes a whole lot of effort to unroll that thing. And with UnionFS, unrolling it is really quite simple. Um, so. Uh, the answer to the, the, that bigger question of, you know, keeping all the versions in sync with all the libraries, sometimes you just have to wait and pick a release point that works. And Ubuntu syn synchronizes their releases with the uh, known desktop uh, releases, yeah. and that's it. So they keep the bulk of the apps in, in synchronization that way, and then they, they sort of shore up everything around underneath it to They've, they've, they've sort of snatched out most of the rest of the stuff in the previous six months, and then they make it all work together with that release, and then they go on. But they affect more or less what we do. I'm kind of uh, naive about all the politics within the Linux community, but how do they affect the <coughs> uh, um, They have, um, well, I think they've largely been resulting, they've largely resulted in turning my name to around to produce FreeSpire. Um, <laughs> Uh, and which is, I think, a very good thing for the Linspire company. But I think when, when we released Freespire, um, I mean, I installed Ubuntu, and it's pretty much a standard Linux desktop. If you go and you click on an MP3, nothing happens. If you go and click on an OG, even, not the, the right things don't happen. So um, if you're worried about licensing, they do absolutely the right thing, except for when they don't. Um, so, for example, there are some binary video drivers that they will compile at boot time in a RAM disk so that you can run those video drivers but not violate the GPL. Wow. Yeah, because, you, because you compiled it. Right. Okay. Because so that's, that's, just, that's, a, that's, that's effectively a loophole in the GPL. And Mark Shuttleworth said at the Debian conference when he was challenged on this that, that, that it's been legally tested internationally and it survived. But the rest of us went, but, but I mean, that, <laughs> that's a loophole. That's not, I mean, you're still using a binary driver and you're saying you're, you're sticking by the GPL. So, I mean, well, we make no bones about it. Look, if, the, if there is no open source driver, we'll use a binary one. We don't like to because they're a real pain in the ass. Regardless of all the politics, the binary drivers are a pain in the ass because they're, you can't fix them, you can't do anything with them. You, you got to guess what's going on inside of them. 
I mean, uh, apart from all correctness, they're just really obnoxious. Do it. Um, although, you know, some vendors have produced some really, really good ones. SmartLink was one company doing moto drivers. They were licensing stuff from the evil empire of the telephone world. That's all they would tell us. But I have to assume it was AT&T or one of the companies that forked off to the, you know, the, the, one of the children of AT&T. Um, but they had to pay the licensing back, and they couldn't release these things because they were patents. But they open sourced as much as they could, and they supported Linux very well. And then they got bought out by Connection because they were doing too well. Um, and then basically got shut down. So, um, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was going with that whole thing. But um, the answer is, we're, we the Free Spire is, was all about um, including the the this community which Michael Robertson hoped he would just, I mean, I think he correctly assumed that, that Linspire is not what most of us want. Although, in fact, I love it because it installs in 10 minutes, it comes up and runs, it detects all your hardware, and you can then go and app get. Well, okay, I can app get because I can get through our firewall. The rest of the world had to buy a subscription through CMR. So now, with free open app tools, I think we're going to a more honest model, which is, Look, all the stuff that Linux, <laughs> Linux built, you can have back for free. Anything you want to do with it, you can use it just as, just as you would any other Linux distribution. If you want the services that are not provided by the Linux community, then you come and buy a $20 CNR subscription, or you buy a 60 you know, version of Win for Win through our subscription, and that's where, you know, that's where you get to the thing. It's also possible we can retarget CNR to work on other distributions, such as Ubuntu. And Mark Shuttleworth would love that. He would, he would love to have CNR going into Ubuntu. So we may do that deal eventually. Um, the real nice thing about CNR is that you can, you know, the story over and over again. I gave it to my spouse who really wanted Windows, but after a while they were up and running, and they can click and run everything they need to. And click and run as a family license, so your entire family and all your computer sets are, you know, covered by one subscription. And we've reduced that to 20 bucks per year. I mean, it's we spend more on dinner, right? Um, but people still complain about it, of course. But um, I, but I mean, you hear you hear wonderful stories every once in a while. The woman went into fries. She would buy a laptop every year for 2K. It would get full of viruses. You know, her IT department wouldn't help her. She couldn't get anybody to fix it. So she basically throw it away and buy a new 2K laptop every year. She goes into Fry's, and, and we, have a, we have a machine in Fry's that's $200 with Linspire on it, and Fry's keeps it there as a whipping boy, basically. <laughs> right? And they say, yeah, you don't want this because it's not as good as this $2,000 thing over there. Well, this woman was completely pissed that she heard this story three years in a row. And the, the $200 machine was on sale for 99 bucks. <laughs> she bought three of them. <laughs> well, that was, that was, 99 bucks are going to be full of viruses so fast that I'm going to have to throw them away faster, right? <laughs> so she bought three of them. And then she sends this letter to Michael Robinson. She said, why doesn't anybody else know about this? It's like, this thing comes up, it runs. I can do everything I do on my Windows machine. It's not full of viruses. This little $99 machine is running way better than these freaking $2,000 laptops I had. Why doesn't anybody else know about this? Well. Because Linux people don't talk to the rest of the world. We're bad enough in the Linux world because we run as root and all these other things, blah, 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 blah. Commercial, you gotta pay for click and run. All that's being fixed in FreeSpire so that hopefully we'll get more people to use FreeSpire, or at least Linux people to try it out and have other people run it, hopefully. Um, and then hopefully you can get to the bigger, that will start some buzz and get through the thing. We're, the OEMs love us because nobody else in the Linux world will do the things that business people want. And I mean, everybody's getting USB keys to be handled these days. But I mean, we're the only people with Windows Media Codecs in there, largely as a result of our settlement with Microsoft, where they said, "Take these, run these." And of course, that's a little hook on their part, right? That gets us to run proprietary formats. But it lets the rest of the world. Look at 90% of the videos out of the world. So there's this, there's this delicate dance in doing a hybrid OS. You want to get more people in. You want to educate them. You want to get them onto open source formats. 
you want more money flowing into the thing. You want the money flowing into people who insist on open source formats going forward. Maybe we can get rid of the legacy closed formats and go forward. That's what we're doing the shot now. Um, I'm going to say, can we call that uh, time here? <laughs> and if you want to continue discussing? I got a two hour drive back to yeah. La Jolla, so. Uh, I thought you said you were going to stay up. I was, but he did. He wasn't going to stay, so. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, that mean we're not going to lure you to BC after all? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would really love to, although, frankly, I think in two and a quarter hours, you've pretty much sucked all the information out. Well, actually, no, David can attest to the fact that I can pretty much go on there. Can we go to Square? Is this place good to eat? Yes, very good. Yeah, BC. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm, I'm totally up for eating. Uh, yeah. as long as we we, we, we adjourn to BC after our, our Caltech welcome to the one time. Just like uh, before everybody goes, just wanted to ask if there's anybody else that's, you know, like used Haskell, OCaml, anything like that. Yeah, you're the only one Define one. used. Doesn't have plans for the summer? Define used. <laughs> yeah. We're looking for an intern at Yahoo. Oh, oh. Uh, um, to do Haskell? Yeah. Um, Haskell, here. Erlang, OCaml. Um, well, yeah, you can give you guys a card because you never introduced. Is this the person that you showed up today, Chris? Oh, yeah.